Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. On today's show, President Biden focuses on democracy as his closing midterm message. Democrats angst over the party's strategy and look for signs of hope in the early vote. Senator Mark Kelly joins to talk about his must-win race in Arizona. And later, Dan and I play a round of two takes and a fake. Let's get to the news. Uh, five days until the polls close, which means time to make some closing arguments, unskew some polls, overanalyze the early vote, and second-guess the strategies of campaigns you weren't part of before the results are known. It's always in, it's always important to Monday morning quarterback and midway through the fourth quarter on Sunday. That's that is how, that's how the best of us do it. Don't do it, and don't do it with your friends. Do it publicly, preferably in the paper of record. <laughs> All right. Kicking things off Wednesday night was President Biden, who delivered a primetime speech on Capitol Hill about what's at stake for democracy in this election. Here is a clip. We, the people, must decide whether we're going to sustain a republic where reality is accepted, the law is obeyed, and your vote is truly sacred. You know, American democracy is under attack because the defeated former president of the United States refuses to accept the results of the 2020 election. Because we've enjoyed our freedoms for so long, it's easy to think they'll always be with us no matter what. But that isn't true today. In our bones, we know democracy at risk is at risk. But we also know this. It's within our power, each and every one of us, to preserve our democracy. What do you think of the speech, Dan? I concur. <laughs> I mean, I agree with every Good. word he said. It is it, the, he is exactly right about the threat that this Republican Party and Donald Trump. Sorry, he's exactly right about the threat that this Republican Party and Donald Trump pose to our country, to this election, to elections in the future. You know, voter suppression, insurrection, not voter nullification. Political violence, are they have all brought to bear a series of very, very dangerous things. And he is, I think, right to call them out. We can talk about the political impact of that, whether that matters, whether it isn't. I dis, I will say I, there is a strain of thought embodied by a column by Jonathan Shade who said every, that basically was everything J- Joe Biden said was right. Should he have said it? No. I disagree with that. I think – you know, there's been all this talk this week, you know, the Monday pod, I've written about it, about sort of Barack Obama's messaging communications lessons, like why he's good at it. One rule he always had was you always talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is the threat this Republican Party poses to our political institutions, to democracy, to freedom, all the like, you can't not talk about that. It would be weird to have an election that did not address the elephant in the room, literally and figuratively in this case. And so I think he had to give the speech. I think people who are panicking about it is it like a mistake are both cut being overly condescending to the voters and dramatically overstating the importance of a speech delivered on three cable news networks at six o'clock at night or nine o'clock at night or whatever time it was, seven o'clock at night. So not even a prime time, a non prime time speech covered by three cable networks watched only by people who've already decided who they're going to vote for. Well, but that right there, to me, is raises the question: Why give the speech? I guess my thing is like I of course agree. So are you with, ag- are you against the speech? Um, I don't think the speech is going to do any damage at all. I think, like I said, I agree with every word of the speech. It is a speech he has given before. It is something he has said many, many, many times before. It is something that many Democrats have said many times before. We had months and months of high profile hearings that that garnered tens of millions of viewers about January 6 and the ongoing threat to democracy that I I'm glad happened. We covered it meant we covered them all on this podcast. Um I think the question is with 5 or 6 days left until the election, what do you want voters to think about when they go into the voting booth? And right now voters are telling us that they are very, that they are struggling, that they are very concerned about the cost of living, about gas, groceries, housing, education, health care, and they're wondering who will do something about that. And to me, like, 
I think that talking about the threat to democracy is necessary, but not sufficient um, when you're trying to convince people to turn out to vote. I don't know whose mind isn't made up about whether or not they are concerned about the threat to democracy posed by the Republican Party at this point. I, I agree with that. I think based on the inf- the data that we have, which is a combination of largely public polling and like a smattering of private polls that you and I still see as people who have like one half of a foot still in like active politics would suggest that the people who care about this issue on the terms in which we think of it, we Democrats and progressives think about the way Joe Biden thinks about it, have already voted, let alone decided who they're going to vote for. And so that is definitely true. So the two things that I want to bring some humility to that declaration to are, one, we do not have access to the same data the White House has. Like, like, that is definitely true. Like, you and I have been it. We've gotten the sort of polling they get. Maybe they see something we don't. It would be surprising to me that they're, that they're, that the polling they see is dramatically different from what we hear from other people who are seeing similar polls. But there is a reason for it. The other reason why they might have just given the speech is because the president felt strongly about it and the election is coming and you give it and there's no, like, master plan behind it. I just think it is, at worst, neutral. In this situation, because I do not believe he could have given a speech that would have been covered by all three networks in something in the neighborhood of prime time about inflation like that would not would not have been like there was not that was not an available card to play. This was the only card to play. The only time in fairness to what else where the press like really like pays attention is when we talk about their favorite issue, which is democracy. If you talk about things that people who don't watch cable news care about, because that's who cares. It's like that is it is cable news viewers are highly politically active, high news consumers who are very focused on democracy. That includes Fox News viewers who think about it in the exact, I would say, incorrect way. And so this is how you get attention. Was this attention about the right thing? Maybe not. I don't think it's the wrong thing, but I'm not sure. it's not the persuasive thing. At worst, neutral, I am in complete agreement with. <laughs> I don't think it did any, uh, yeah, I don't think it did any damage at all. Because, partly because, like I said, I believe everything that he said. But I do think there's, like, like you mentioned Obama, and mentioning the elephant in the room, Obama talked about the threat to democracy in all of his speeches over the last week when he was campaigning. But it was sort of like three quarters of the way through the speech. <laughs> and the way he talked about it was, I realize that democracy may not be an issue that's on the top of your mind as much as inflation and gas prices and abortion access and gun violence. I realize that. But Here's why it's important, right? And so he he sort of tried to meet people where they are. And I just wonder, I wonder, you know, it, it's it's there's only so many opportunities uh, to get a message out between now and Election Day. And I feel like every one of those opportunities is incredibly valuable and shouldn't be missed. And I think there we have seen two kinds of Joe Bidens over the last several years, uh, especially in this in the 2020 campaign and in the White House. And one is like uh, John Meacham, Joe Biden, where he gives speeches that are like very lofty and written for history about democracy. And the other is uh, Scranton, Joe Biden, where he talks about uh, fighting for working class people like the people he grew up with. And he means it and he feels passionate about it because he feels like that's who Joe Biden is. And I think at this moment, the country and Joe Biden will be better served with Scranton Joe Biden than uh, John Meacham write for history books Joe yeah. Biden. I think we would, I, I agree with that. We would also need a time machine to go back like nine months to mm-hmm. have the president do that and the entire yeah. party do that. And there have been times where he has done it certainly more than other members of his party or other members of the sort of democratic, you know, pundits, for sure. personalities, media folks, whatever. There is one, I want to just put a pin in something to, that maybe we can come back to uh, after the election, yeah. after the votes have been cast, because it may turn out that the votes will prove what I'm about to say incorrect. Mm-hmm. But I have this lingering concern about how we're talking about democracy as a party. Joe Biden is talking about it in the way we have all been talking about it for five years now, since Donald Trump, seven years, whatever, ever since Donald Trump ruined our lives. Yeah. We've been talking about it the same way, and especially since January 6th. And when I was, and I thought about this as I was watching the speech last night, which is 
because of the very real threat of Trump and MAGA Republicans, we, the anti-Trump majority in this country, Democrats, never Trumpers, that group, that group of people, have appointed ourselves protectors of democracy. And in doing so, what I now worry about is that we've appointed ourselves the protectors of a political system that has not worked for the vast majority of Americans for a long time. Yeah. And that we have, we have made ourselves status quo. And we think of democracy as this end in of itself, like this political system that is good that we should protect. It is a separate thing from inflation. When if you're just like a person sitting at home who is working really hard, trying to do everything right, and now your wages haven't gone up, but now the cost of gas and groceries have gone way up, to you, that's a failure of politics. That's not a – that says something about the political system that it's not working for you and that if we – we're going to – whatever happens on Tuesday, this battle is going to continue You know, in the 24, whether it's Trump or some other person, like this is going to be the stakes. And I think we have to go from being the protectors of democracy to the reformers of democracy, that we have to be trying to fix the political system because right now it's we want to protect the system that doesn't work and they want to tear it down. And for some number of voters, tearing it down is going to seem pretty fucking appealing, particularly in an, in a, an economic environment like we're currently in. And we have to shift that where it's like reform that is making it a system that works better, like a lot of things we talk about, like filibuster, et cetera, but also getting corruption out of the system. You know, the fact that the party went back to taking lobbyist donations like seven years ago is fucking insane. The fact that we brought earmarks back, like all of that stuff, how do we clean it, fix the system, clean it up? Like that is like how I think we're going to probably have to shift our rhetoric when it comes to democracy, to democracy, if that makes sense. It makes sense. It's the exact conclusion I reached after doing all those focus groups in the wilderness and talking to not just groups of voters, but like some of the smartest strategists in the party. Like if we want to persuade people to save democracy, we have to persuade them that democracy is worth saving. That is just the fundamental thing. And the way that, and and this is not just like guessing that we're doing here. We talked about a couple episodes ago, that New York Times poll. And, and look, Biden cites this in the speech last night. He said, oh, it's a top concern for a lot of people. But when the New York Times asked people what they meant by they're concerned about threats to democracy, most people said it's about corruption. It's about the fact that the government is not working on behalf of ordinary people anymore. And like I keep thinking especially of uh, whatever happens in this election, right? Like say say we squeak by. This is still going to be, it's, it's, you know, the polls are wrong and, and Democrats squeak by. This is still going to be an issue because we have still been hemorrhaging working class voters not just white, but Latino and now black men as well over the last several elections. We have been losing them, okay? And you wonder why do we continue to lose working class voters? Well, I I keep thinking about like the two focus groups that, that stick with me the most are sort of the working class Latinos I spoke to in Las Vegas and the working class black voters I spoke to in Atlanta. And unprompted when I asked them, what's going on? What's bothering you? Inflation, housing, crime. And, you know, this this woman, I keep thinking about her in Vegas, and she's like, she spoke passionately about how angry she is at Republicans for wanting to ban abortion, how angry she is at them for wanting to, she's like, you can, you tell me that I have to have a child, and yet I can't tell you not to bring a gun uh, to a school to, sh to shoot my kids. I have to worry about my kids going to school, and you're telling me, so she was very passionate about these issues. She said that, you know, uh, they all said that uh, Adam Laxalt is a big lie supporter, so they don't like him. But the top issue is housing. The thing they're most concerned about is housing. And this woman was like, I have gone from motel to motel for three months because I couldn't afford rent and I work two jobs and no one is doing anything about it. And if you're that person and you tune into the news and you see a speech about democracy and institutions and, and election deniers and stuff like that, and then you go on Twitter or you go on social media and you see people saying like, oh, well, the reason that people are upset about inflation is because the media has brainwashed them or the media has covered crime. And actually, look, crime statistics in red states are just as are worse than in blue states and blah, 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 blah. And you're thinking to yourself, OK, well, I can't afford to live somewhere and I'm really worried about crime in my neighborhood. And no one seems to be talking about these things like do you really 
I know we want those people to understand the threat in the way that we understand the threat. I get that. But if they're not, have we thought about trying another way to persuade them to join our pro-democracy coalition? And maybe part of that is to say, like, yeah, we're going to fight like hell for you. And we're going to fight like hell to make sure that you can afford to live somewhere. And by the way, that other fucking party, they're not because they care about their rich friends and their wingnut Christian nationalist base. That's all they care about. So they're going to focus on that shit. We're going to focus on you. We're going to fight like hell for you. I, I... We have ceded the reform issue to a party run by corrupt billionaires. It's wild. and We never talk about it. It's It's just... And this is not like going down the path of huge government spending and social, all that bullshit. It is people want to hold corporations and wealth and power accountable. They want our institutions to work for them because if we cannot make institutions work for them, they will vote for demagogues who will break those institutions because they're so frustrated. So like, let's talk about, so that was Biden's closing argument. Every candidate is making their own closing argument. Um, we have a sample of some of the final ads from Senate candidates. Uh, John Fetterman, Mandela Barnes, Tim Ryan, and uh, Congresswoman Elaine Luria. Uh, let's listen. J.D. Vance, a fraud who invests in companies that outsource jobs to China. That ain't Ohio. An extremist who calls rape inconvenient and toxically believes women should stay in violent marriages. That is not Ohio. A California imposter who grew a beard and wore flannel to fit in. In the Senate, Johnson wrote a loophole that gave huge tax cuts to himself and his biggest donors. And while our costs are rising, he supports a plan that would raise taxes on the middle class. Ron Johnson looks out for himself, not us. Oz has spent his life taking advantage of people, making himself rich. I've taken on the powerful, been different. Oz will only work for himself in Washington, just like the rest. He lies for your vote. I'll never break your trust. If you support insurrectionists or call our military weak, I'm not your candidate. If you attack the FBI and defend Donald Trump, I'm not your candidate. And if you believe the 2020 election was stolen, definitely not your candidate. All right. So if you think these messages sound like they're a bit all over the map, you're not alone. Uh, here's the New York Times in a classic of the genre. Uh, headline is top Democrats question their party strategy as midterm worries grow. Uh, leading lawmakers and strategists are openly doubting the party's kitchen sink approach, saying Democrats have failed to unite around one central message. Uh, Dan, what do you think? Are they right? Was it even possible for the party to unite around a central message? What do you think? John, you know how in an NBA game at the end of like the third quarter, they make the coaches do this interview, like mm -hmm. all for the televised games. And then the coach says nothing. Just, we're working hard. We're going to have defense get better. The, imagine if the coaches were like, I don't know. Team kind of sucks. Wish we'd done something. <laughs> Wish our point guard could dribble. <laughs> That's basically what is happening here. That you injury, can just say. That, that injury really fucked us. <laughs> <laughs> Not just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's happening there. You got to have better players. <laughs> it's just, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know, John. It just. <laughs> I mean, there are a few different and sometimes conflicting criticisms in the piece but just to oversimplify the debate they're basically this is sort of the one we were just talking about there are some people who think democrats have focused too much on abortion and democracy and not enough on inflation and crime other people who think democrats haven't focused enough on the threat that republicans pose to democracy and abortion access and other freedoms what do you make of this debate it is interesting you know we we were just talking about sort of seeding uh the mantle of you know fighting corruption to Republicans and billionaires and stuff like that. You did hear in almost all of those ads, except uh, Elaine Laurie is at the end, who, of course, she is a member of the um, January 6th committee. Uh, she is in a sort of college educated area. That's her district. But Fetterman, Barnes, uh, Ryan, very economically populist closing ads. What do you make of all this? Yeah, I think that's the right close. You know, we this is going to be very on brand, but I think the right messaging is a lot of what Obama has been saying. It is connecting democracy to the economy and connecting the issue of the economy to who the candidate is going to fight for. And that is the right thing to do. And I think there's two, like part of the critique in that article is Democrats didn't settle on a single message. Yeah. Like, why don't we have a single message? And I think 
there's kind of a couple ways to look at that. One is it's particularly in Senate races, which are largely about the candidates, which is why in many cases the Democrats are doing much better in those Senate races than the generic ballot would suggest or Joe Biden's approval rating would suggest because they become about the candidates, They're about Herschel Walker, Raphael Warnock or Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance or whatever else. And in that case, you kind of want to have a campaign that's specific to those candidates. Like you're going to run a different race against Dr. Oz than you are J.D. Vance or Herschel Walker. I do think nationally there is an argument, if we could go back in time, for a singular branding of Republicans. Mm -hmm. Because Republicans have a singular brand on Democrats. They have a much greater megaphone to shout that brand from. And to do it. and for a while over the summer, we did like the, we were ever because of the Dobbs decision. Everyone was painting the Republicans as extreme, with abortion as an example of that, and that did work for the course of the summer. When additional voters who were not as politically engaged checked in in the fall, and when the economy changed a little bit, that shifted under us. And I don't ne- know that we necessarily shifted with us. But the other here's the important point here: we don't know whether this is right or wrong. We're going to find out. We're actually, it's actually probably going to take like 10 days before we know, Hmm. but we'll know what, you know, I think each of these messages are good and interesting. And it's and given the demographics of Elaine Luria's uh, district and her role in the January 6th committee, that very well may be the right message for her. Hmm. Um, But we're just, we're just going to have, it's, this is what drives me insane about this article is a bunch of people who stick their finger in the wind to see which way it's blowing, think it's blowing the wrong way for Democrats, then rush out to call a reporter to tell them they knew it was going to go wrong all along and they're smarter than the people who have to actually make the decisions. Yeah, no, that is, uh, look, I know we dispense a lot of uh, advice and analysis here. I, I should say, like, I don't know what the hell the right answer is either for sure. But I do think like all, I think, again, regardless of the results, I think all of us have to be a little, those of us who, are engaged in politics, pay attention to politics or close to politics. There is this like tendency to dismiss voters as if, as if they're like this, like alien group of people, right? Like you hear focus groups, you hear polls and you're like, Oh, what is that? Or you say, Oh, the voters are wrong or the voters are crazy. Or I'm so frustrated with the voters. And I do think that like all we can do is just listen to each other. Listen, the voters aren't just like some foreign group of people they're like our fellow citizens we need their votes to win you know and like all we can do is go out there and listen to them and talk to people and 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 understand what their concerns are and how to get their votes like that i just it's it's a lot it's a lot can can i just say one more thing about this it's probably not constructive but it might have a little bit of catharsis to it sure which is there is a genre of person within our party who looks at something terrible Republicans do and their first instinct is to yell at Democrats about it. Yeah. A right winger radicalized on irresponsible Republican rhetoric tries to murder the Democratic Speaker of the House. And the first thing is not to yell at the Republicans, not to yell at the media infrastructure that radicalized that person, is to yell at Democrats for not talking about that, for not raising the threat more. And I think if you're one of those people, you ought to look in the mirror. Because that you are missing the point. And you should recognize that you have found yourself in a law lo- in a lane that has existed for a long time. Because there is always a place of relevance in American politics for a Democrat who shits on Democrats. Yeah. And that person has a reserved seat on the Sunday show roundtables. If you look at it, Joe Lieberman's name is etched on the back. Like you are following in that level. And I think, and that is not to say that the party is immune to criticism. Far from it. We have offered some here today. Maybe we should maybe even offer some more. But I think that criticism has to have some basis in the following things. One, a realistic understanding of the limits of power the Democrats have. Nancy Pelosi cannot make AOC and Abigail Spanberger agree on everything. Chuck Schumer cannot make Joe Manchin abolish the filibuster. Like that is not within their power. Joe Biden has a much smaller bully pulpit than we would like to think. He cannot bend public opinion to his will. Maybe he should be trying harder to do so, but that he cannot, It is. this is not the West Wing. Next, I think if you're going to criticize, offer specific ideas based in those limitations I just talked about. 
Simply saying, do more, shout louder is not advice. Third, to your point, use data to back up why you think we're do- Democrats are doing something wrong. And if you're someone who just says polls are all wrong or focus groups are bullshit, you are basically doing the public opinion version of climate denial. You are just disregarding science to prove to reinforce your pre-existing point. Because even if you think polling is wrong, there's lots of other data out there. There's the precinct level data that Catalyst does. There's the uh, validated voter study from Pew. There's political science research. There's like real, you can walk out your fucking door and just talk to some people. Yes, you can touch grass while you do it. Just touch some grass, get off your computer and just talk to some people. I'm begging of you. Yeah, there's this whole stream like, oh, the Democrats have, have relied too much on data and like data becomes this like amorphous evil thing. It's like the data is just what people are saying. <laughs> yes. It's just pilots. Voters, it's just voters. Pilots opinion. rely too much on radar. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> like you want to save democracy? That's what democracy is. It's 300 million people who all have different opinions and who all have different and all are in different places. And you got to get a majority of them to be on your side to win. That's it. That's, that's the, that is the most basic element of what we're doing here. <laughs> Last point about these people. If after all of that, you are still so sure you are right and they are so wrong, put down your phone and get in the fucking game. Yeah, right. Go, go run, run get for it. something. Run for something. Go apply for a job on Capitol Hill. Start a political organization. Use your platform to actually mobilize instead of criticize. Get in the game. If all you're doing is, if you think Republicans are so bad that you have to yell at Democrats, I really think you're missing the point. All right. I feel... <laughs> a little bit better now. No one in my house has slept through the night in like two weeks. I am underfed, overcaffeinated, extremely tired. I needed that. I want to thank you, our listeners, for whatever part of that does not get cut, or perhaps should be. I feel better. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to have a lot more to, we'll have a lot more to say. I mean, the next, uh, the next few weeks are going to be something. It's either going to be I, triumphalism or... I wanted to ask you one more question, but now I feel like it's going to trigger you, so maybe I won't. But well, because I, I, it's just a question because you are our um, Crooked Media's biggest YouTube star with Political Experts React, and yes. so I know that you focus a lot on ads. But it's interesting to me that, like, I would say again, my opinion could be wrong, but um, Fetterman, Ryan, Barnes, all of those ads focusing on economic populism, focusing on like they're fighting for people in their state and their opponents are not. I'd say those are right on the money. I do think it's become difficult for, like, you get all these ads, these paid ads that are all about sort of economic populism and drawing the economic contrast. And then the earned media, meaning like what the narrative is about, what the press writes about, what voters see when they're not watching ads, but still are consuming information about politics. That's almost never about the economy. <laughs> uh, it's never, or at least it's not, it's about like high inflation. It's about gas prices and inflation, but it's not about like, the fight between Democrats and Republicans over what they would each do about it. And I wonder, like, do you think these ads are effective? Do you think like Democrats, how do, how do we like sort of break through uh, sort of the, and get more earned media about these economic fights? I think the use of the term earned media is an anachronism in this day and age. Mm. And that we should not think about the coverage. We should think about the conversation. And what people okay. are talking about. And the, one of the challenges that Democrats face, and this is a challenge that's really been true since a, every election after the 2012 presidential election, is that the conversation is happening around cultural issues. And so the ads on economic populism that work are the ones that use it as a way to tell a story about who their opponent is. It's a values-based argument about them. It is a proxy for a larger conversation. But we have a dramatic challenge, which is people... Issues only matter if they interact with what is happening in the world, what they're thinking about. Mm. And we have a media ecosystem and a social media ecosystem that bends heavily towards cultural identity issues because that's the only way to get attention and drive traffic in this day and age. And it's been this huge shift in politics, um, not to promote another podcast on this one, but Ezra Klein had a podcast this week with uh, Lynn Vavrick and John Sides, who are two very political smart. science professors. Very political science professors who do in-depth studies of the, I think the last three presidential elections, but their 2020 study just came out and they write, it's essentially a book about it. And one of the points they make is in their, I think this was in their 2016 study, 
is that up until 2016, the axis upon which politics was fought were New Deal based issues from Franklin Roosevelt to through the 2012 election. It was it was about size of government, who benefits, how you pay for it, taxes, et cetera. And that shifted to cultural issues in 2016. And we have not yet recovered or found a way to pivot it back to our stuff. And I think that's going to really require thinking about it. I don't have the answers differently. Like, how do you make the economy a cultural issue? And populism is one way to do that. Um, mixing it with reform is another way to do that. But I think that's going to be one of the big tasks going forward, whether we win or lose on Tuesday. Yeah, Ezra's been on this beat because uh, he also had a political scientist on who uh, talked about how this is not just a, an American phenomenon, by the way. This is sort of why we're seeing the rise of right-wing populist parties all over the world, is that this axis has shifted um, not just here, but all over the place where it's now this sort of cultural divide more so than an economic one. And you're right. I don't, I don't think there's not an easy answer of just like listing off economic policies more like that's not, I don't think that's going to do it. <laughs> it's much bigger than that. But, but we do at least have to recognize that that's, that's the issue right now. And that's where there's this huge divide between non-college and college voters, uh, which we find ourselves on a side that doesn't have as many people. <laughs> Well, it has more people, just not allocated a, appropriately among the states that decide to set an electoral college. Correct, correct, correct. Um, all right. So before we get to the interview, um, we just we, we want to help people uh, make sense of the debates. You might have noticed around uh, two things: partisan polls and the early vote. Um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna give you guys this, uh, but only if you sign up for Vote Save America shifts. <laughs> So I'm I'm just going to trust you all that right now you're signing up for some Vote Save America shifts, and now we'll dig in. Uh, Dan, let's take each of these separately. Um, there's been some Democrats have pointed out that the polling averages are just have they've been flooded with um, polls that are either from Republican firms or Republican leaning firms, and that's sort of screwing up the average. And you know, former Clinton staffer Simon Rosenberg he's he's called this Republican propaganda designed to shape public opinion uh, about who's winning. Um, what do you, what do you make of that? There, there is an element of truth to what Simon is saying and that what something happened in 2020, which is forever the real clear politics polling average was sort of the gold standard of polling average. It's certainly before various Nates got involved in data science and started reading <laughs> them. It was just like, we're going to instead of look at one poll, look at all of these polls. And yeah. In the Trump era, a bunch of right-wing billionaires bought the bought real clear politics, and they changed the polling standards and started letting in a whole bunch of j shit polls, mm -hmm. Republican polls. And in 2020, that did affect the average. Now, the reason why this is somewhat of a flawed argument is by adding in the Republican polls, the Republican leading polls, it actually brought the average closer to the real results in right. the states than before. Yeah. And so that's one of the problems. Like there are more Republican polls. There's not a bunch of Democratic Trafalgar's out there like putting out polls. But the problem is Trafalgar got an A rating because they were right. Now, are they right in a Brooklyn clock sense? Probably because they just they err on the side of Republicans. And that has been the, the way to be right um, in recent years. But ultimately, whether the averages have moved by half a point or not, who cares? And just pick a poll that you want to trust, right? That could be the you know, New York Times, uh, Siena polls, or the NBC, Wall Street polls. They all show basically the same thing, which yeah. is incredibly close races that have moved somewhat in the Republican direction over the last month. Yeah. Whether that's by one point or two points, it doesn't matter. If you take out all the, the Republican and Republican-leaning polls, you still have uh, an extremely close horse race that Republicans have uh, probably have like a tiny edge on right now. So that's that's just the truth. All right, what about the early vote? Well, just this is our our annual warning about the early vote. What do you think? So it is true that polls are guesses and early vote is actual votes. These are people mm -hmm. who have actually voted. The problem with the early vote is we don't know how much of the picture it's telling us for a couple of reasons. One is to measure democratic performance, you have to measure it against a baseline of something. And there is no good baseline in this election because the in 2020, the voting rules changed 
in a lot of states because of the pandemic, states that did not allow early votes started allowing early vote votes that didn't allow mail ballots started allowing mail ballots. And even in the states with long histories of early voting, voting behavior in those states changed. Like, for yeah. example, Florida is a state where Republicans always did better in the early vote than Democrats before 2020. But now that how you vote, thanks to Donald Trump, now how you vote is almost as important as who you, for whom you vote. Republicans now tend to vote even more so at the on election day and Democrats vote by mail. So you can't compare this to 2020 because that's a presidential election with a large voter pool. And you can't compare it to 2018 because that's before a seismic shift in how people voted. So if you see numbers that so Democrats are doing so much better than they were in 2018, maybe that's something great. Maybe not. Maybe it just tells you that a bunch of people who in 2018 voted on election day now vote early because they think that's a very convenient, awesome, safe way to vote. Next, in some states will tell you, will, the Secretary of State will release who voted by party, number of Democrats, number of Republicans, number of unaffiliated. That, that is informative. You know, Even without a baseline, that's interesting. Yeah. The problem is some states have a very large unaffiliated number, in some cases larger than I – like in Colorado and I think New Hampshire, larger than either party. And so when you see these, these – in these states that do not release party, partisan voting – you're seeing modeling done based on who they think voted. And so maybe that is right. Maybe it's wrong. We don't know. And so it is, this is all very – polling may be imprecise. These are also imprecise ways to make judgments. And once again, we're going to find out before too long. And the one exception to this, everything we just said here, is usually uh, John Ralston, uh, reporter in Nevada, who knows Nevada better than anyone else, who does an early voting blog – and the reason that and, – and, and Ralston doesn't say like, oh, I know exactly what the outcome is going to be. He gives you like different models and different projections. But the reason that Nevada is different is because you get a, a – most of the electorate votes early or by mail before election day. And so if you, you know the denominator then, you know that most people have voted and they release the Democrat versus Republican split – um, you can have a better sense of what might happen. Now, even there, there's unaff a lot of unaffiliated voters and you don't know what the split there is going to be. So, and, and Ralston has like different projections like, oh, if Indies split, it looks like this. If Indies go 10 points for Republicans, it goes this way. So you can do it that way. But that one's like, that's like a little more, you get a little more information out of Nevada. Um, but the rest of the states, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really like, bother. Ultimately, I think we are all, Spend using early vote, polling average, unskewing stuff, trying to figure out what is going to happen instead of trying to make happen what we want to happen, right? That's why yeah. everyone who's still listening to this via our activism based Patreon has already signed up for Vote Save America. So only the volunteer, only the good people know this now. Hopefully, and if you somehow hopefully snuck everyone in, has, hopefully has, everyone has turned us off five minutes ago and they're just making calls right now. Oh, that's a good point. We are just speaking to each other. We're just to talking each to other. each other. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when we come back, I'll talk to Arizona Senator Mark Kelly. The presenting sponsor, Pod Save America, is Simply Safe Home Security. No matter what's going on in the political world, you should be able to feel safe at home. With Simply Safe, you can relax knowing that their advanced technology and 24 7 professional monitoring are there to protect your home. If you order now, you'll get 50% off any new system. Simply Safe was named the best home security system of 2022 by U.S. News and World Report, a third year in a row. In an emergency, professional monitoring agents use Fast Protect technology exclusively from Simply Safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real so you can get faster police dispatch, all for under $1 a day. Simply Safe is whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. With the top rated Simply Safe app, arm or disarm, unlock for a guest, access your cameras, or adjust system settings. Mr. Lovett over here has Simply Safe. <laughs> you bet I do, John. I set up a Simply Safe system. And it works perfectly. And I recommend everyone get one. There you go. Don't miss your chance for massive savings on our favorite security system. Get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash crooked today. This is their biggest discount of the year. That's simplysafe.com slash crooked. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Today's episode is sponsored by Athletic Brewing Company, America's leading non alcoholic craft brewer. There's nothing worse than waking up with a hangover and feeling terrible. True. But imagine that you can enjoy great tasting brews all night long and still crush your tomorrow. That's Imagine that. You, often, you guys crush often say tomorrow. that to me. Hey, How are we going to crush our tomorrow? Let's crush our tomorrows. Enter Athletic Brewing. They're great tasting non-alcoholic beers 
are legendary. Athletic makes over 50 different brews each year and has won over five dozen prestigious brewing awards for its wide selection of IPAs, Goldens, Darks, Light Brews, and more. And since their brews are fit for all times, that, that was all capitalized, by the way, you can drink them anytime, anywhere. If you're cutting back on alcohol, you owe it to yourself to try Athletic Brewing today. From now until December 31st, new Athletic customers can receive 20% off their first order of two six-packs or more when they visit athleticbrewing.com and use the code PODSAVE20 at checkout. That's PODSAVE20 for 20% off your first order of two six-packs or more at athleticbrewing.com. PODSAVE America is brought to you by Aura. We all do a lot to keep ourselves and our families safe. We wear our seatbelts when we drive. We replace the batteries in our smoke detectors when they beep. And we lock our front door when we leave the house or go to bed. But what do we do to keep ourselves safe online? The answer for most people is nothing. Aura is on a mission to create a safer internet. And for Aura, that not only means creating the best security products, it means making it so easy you actually use it. You can easily keep your password safe and secure, like automatically updating vulnerable passwords on selected sites. Quickly know if someone has attempted to use your identity or credit without your permission with alerts to your app, phone, or email, up to four times faster than competitors. Also, Aura doesn't just catch threats, they help you resolve them. With 24-7 U.S.-based support and dedicated resolution agents, Aura's team will be there for you to resolve fraud issues, even if it means getting on a three-way call with your bank at midnight. Aura doesn't play games. You can trust that all plans come with the features you need to stay safe online without having to purchase add-ons. Just choose whether you want to protect yourself, two adults, or your whole family. Now, for a limited time, Aura is offering our listeners a 14-day trial, plus a check of your data to see if you've already been part of a data breach, all for free when you visit Aura.com slash Crooked. Go to Aura.com slash Crooked and sign up for a 14-day free trial and see if you've already been part of a data breach for free. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash Crooked. Certain terms apply. See site for details. Aura is the new standard in digital safety. Pod Save America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. The midterm elections are here, and all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 seats in the Senate are up for grabs. Do you guys know that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All those roles need to be filled with the most qualified people. Got bad news for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not going to be. No, not, not happen. But not every role has to be that difficult to fill, especially if you're hiring for your business. That's because there's ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter does the work for you. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Crooked. When you post your job on ZipRecruiter, it uses powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job and sends them to you. Then you can easily review these recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. If you want a better way to find great people for your team, try ZipRecruiter for free right now at this special URL, ZipRecruiter.com slash Crooked. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash C-R-O-O-K-E-D. Then elect to take some time for you because you've got ZipRecruiter to help. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Joining us today, a former Navy captain, retired astronaut, and current senator from Arizona, who's in one of the closest and most important midterm races in the country. Mark Kelly, welcome to Pod Save America. John, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on. I think this is, I think it's my first time on the show. So it is. It is. We're lucky to have you. Um, <clears throat> so last night, President Biden uh, focused his closing midterm argument on the threat to democracy posed by extremism and election deniers like your opponent. You have focused your closing argument on your bipartisan track record, economic opportunity, public safety. Can you talk about why you've prioritized those messages over uh, the one that we heard from President Biden last night? Well, let me let me first say, I think both of these messages are important. Um you know, I am not your uh, typical politician. You know, I'm a guy about getting stuff done. I was in the Navy for 25 years. I spent 15 years at NASA. I come from an operational background. Um, you know, my message, uh, you know, for the last six months has been about a lot of different things, you know, about uh, good paying jobs here in the state of Arizona, about bringing down costs for families, you know, gas and groceries and housing. It's just too expensive. So I've been focused in focused on delivering on those things. But I also think it's really important to know. And I think the president made this point while I didn't see the speech last night. You know, I was busy, busy with a campaign event. I imagine you're probably going to ask about. Um, I think it's an important message to send. And that is that this democracy we've had for near, nearly 250 years is not something that's guaranteed. And we're going to have to fight for it. And there are forces out there. Um, you know, that could, um, over a period of time, cause this whole thing to unravel. You know, I've said this before on the campaign trail that I really think the wheels could come off of our democracy because of people like my opponent, Blake Masters, 
who is denying the 2020 you know election again here in Arizona, doesn't denying the outcome. He did it in the beginning of the campaign, and then he stopped for a while. <laughs> yeah, and then about three weeks ago, he gets a phone call from a guy in Florida. Uh, that uh, says he has to start doing it again. So he's now he's denying the 2020 election. But what, what's worse than that is he's also denying an election that's still, you know, five, six days in the future here. He started doing that uh, already. So, yeah, these, this is this is dangerous. And um, and I, I, I didn't see all the president's remarks, but he I, I assume I, I understand what he was trying to say, and I think that's an, an important message for people to hear. Uh, you mentioned ec- people's economic concerns. Obviously, you know, interest rates are, keep rising to tamp down inflation. That's also softened the housing markets. So now we got higher prices, higher credit card interest. Homes are worth less. If the Democrats hold the House and the Senate, w- what do you think the party should do to improve the economic situation? Yeah, well... You know, nobody saw this pandemic coming. And, you know, we've been in this now for three years and it was incredibly disruptive, especially to supply chains. And that still exists in many sectors of the economy today, you know, where manufacturers can't get parts, you know, for businesses can't get the products Um, there. At least right now, there's a shortage in the labor market because of the disruption. You know, I, you know, we also we we often think of our economy as, you know, this very stable, you know, well functioning, you know, machine. And when 2020 hit, I think we all realized that it's a lot less stable than we than than we realized. You know, I think of this and a lot a lot of times in terms of my old job, you know, with airplanes that are unstable, you push it, push it off in one little direction and it it, it could go out of control. Um, as a test pilot, you know, that was a big part of, you know, my responsibility was testing things in airplanes and changes. And I think we realized that their little disruption in the economy can have rippling effects. We're still feeling, feeling that today. We've got to continue to address rising costs. Uh, interest rates are now a factor here, but that is by choice. You know, that the Fed is making a decision to raise interest rates uh, to stop or slow uh, inflation. Um, These are hard decisions. I think it's hard to get this exactly right. Um, But consumers now who were impacted, you know, with higher costs, now they're going to have higher borrowing costs and businesses, they're going to have higher borrowing costs, and it's going to make it more difficult for businesses to grow. You know, these are the kind of things that, um, you know, could multiply into, you know, into other problems. I think right now, you know, the Fed has taken the right steps in raising interest rates. I know there are some folks that, you know, disagree with that. Uh, But we have to, um, you know, stop stop this uh, inflationary pressure, this upward, you know, inflation. We have some of the highest inflation, highest rising costs in the country are in Maricopa County. And, uh, you know, I remember as a kid, I was in middle school and high school in the late 70s and early 80s. I remember what that was like, you know, first the high inflation and then the high interest rates. It was hard for my mom, especially. She was the one in our family who would have to pay the bills. And I remember her sitting at the kitchen table with all the, you know, all the bills trying to figure out what to pay. She had one of those giant calculators. Mm. Remember the calculator about that big? And she was trying to figure it out. So I know what folks are going through. That's why I've worked to address this, you know, address it with the White House specifically on the price of gasoline. Um, I talked to a guy down in Yuma uh, who lives about 50, 60 miles from work. He He's a federal government contractor. And he told me, he says, it's starting to be unaffordable for him to go to work because he's got this 60 mile commute each way every single day. And it's getting really, really expensive. So, you know, I've called on the administration to increase oil and gas production. Uh, They did a little bit of it. And then we put it in the Inflation Reduction Act to compel the federal government to expand leasing in in the Gulf of Mexico. But we have to do more. Uh, What What do you think about the windfall profits tax that President Biden floated this week? Well, I think it's something to consider. And I will. I'll be back in uh, back in this in DC uh, a week from Monday, 
Uh, there's a lot of issues that we have to address. Um, Want to make sure the government stays funded. There's, mm. you know, some folks that uh, that serve in the United States Congress that are perfectly fine with the government shutting down. That's not an option for me. Um, I mean, the just, you know, just across the country, the role of the federal government. Um, and when the government shuts down, it hurts people. Yeah. And uh, we can't allow that to happen. Um, you mentioned the rally that you were at uh, with my old boss, Barack Obama, last night, um, where he said that if you were trying to create a la- in a lab a wacky Republican politician, it would look a lot like Blake Masters. What do you think of that characterization of your opponent? It's funny. Um, <laughs> you know, I often try to stick to the facts and what people say. Um, I appreciate the, the sentiment. Uh, my opponent's. You know, he's a relatively young guy. He's new to this. I'm new new to this, too. Um, but he has some ideas that I think and some beliefs. I mean, beliefs are almost worse than ideas when they're dangerous. And he's got some beliefs that are just dangerous for Arizonans um, on everything. I think if you look across the country for, for, you know, a challenger for a U.S. Senate seat, a competitive U.S. Senate seat, I think there's an argument to be made that he's got the most extreme views, um, whether it's on abortion, he calls abortion demonic and a religious sacrifice and says he wants to punish the doctors. I mean, think about this. He wants to punish doctors for delivering health care to women. And he wants a national abortion ban that's so strict that even in the case of when a woman is raped, she will not be able to make this decision herself or between her and her doctor. I mean, that's what he wants. And the national abortion ban he wants could criminalize this decision for women. Um, Social Security. I mean, he has said during the campaign on a debate stage, people are usually pretty careful and thoughtful about what they say during a debate. They know it's recorded. um, And he got caught telling the truth. You know, he says he wants to privatize Social Security. Even he I hadn't heard this before. Uh, he used the term, he wants to cut the knot. Yeah. I don't know exactly what that means, but I can tell you this. It doesn't sound good. doesn't sound it does good. Not, it does not sound good. I mean, <laughs> cutting the knot on a senior, you know, who's just trying to get by. I meet so many seniors in our state that are having to make these, you know, really tough economic decisions all the time. And he wants to send their Social Security earnings to Wall Street. I mean, who makes money in that deal? Wall Street. Uh, so on issue after issue, he's got he's got some really dangerous views about our uh, about the United States military that I served in for, um, uh, you know, tw- over 25 years, uh, says our military is totally incompetent. I mean, uh, th- these are beliefs that are dangerous. So I um, I get what uh, your for- former boss uh, was trying to articulate there. So uh, President Biden started his speech last night by um talking about the horrifying attack on Paul Pelosi. You and your family sadly understand the threat of political violence in a personal way. Your wife, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, was was shot during an event with constituents in, in 2011. How has that tragedy shaped your views on political violence and what we do about it as a country? I would say more than anything else. I mean, it has, um, you know, made it very real for us. You know, it's affected, you know, my wife and and me, too. I mean, when Gabby got shot in 2011, I mean, she was nearly assassinated. Mm. Six people died, 12 others injured. You know, this was a this was politically motivated. This individual had come to a previous event of hers, didn't like what she said, planned this attack. Um. The rhetoric that we see out there and the polarization and the political, you, you know, just the, the, the this charged political atmosphere that we live in right now, I think it makes it more likely that these things will occur. Um, that's why I've been focused on. And you mentioned my message, which is also what I've done in the United States Senate, which is bringing people together, working with Republicans not accepting that we have to live in a world where the other party is the enemy. That's not true for me. That's not true for many of my colleagues in the Senate. I would say it's not true for most of them. 
Um, so we've got to fight back against these forces. And what happened to Paul Pelosi was just horrific. I mean, that individual was there, in my opinion, to to kill the Speaker of the House. Yeah. You know, that's that's what happened to Gabby. It ended Gabby's career. It ended my career at NASA and my career in the United States Navy. What happened in January of 2011? We can't accept that that this is somehow the new normal. And that's why we have to call out individuals um, who try to normalize this. And that's happened over the last you know, weeks since this you know, happened to the speaker's husband. And there are folks that just dismiss it and they make jokes about it. This isn't funny. It's serious. And those individuals shouldn't think for a second that they're immune to it happening to them. I mean, this is as this problem grows, it exposes more and more individuals. You know, I don't know what the numbers is, the numbers are in, in the United States Congress, but the death threats that members of the United States Senate get, I'm speaking from my experience, mm. it is significant. I mean, the threats of violence against us um, and, you know, of you know, for 535 of us, I can't imagine what that number is. It, it, it has got to be off the charts. And these are, you know, for the most part, individuals is, that are just trying to serve our country and make our country a better place, even when we disagree. But we've got individuals out there that um, you, you, just just the way they conduct themselves um you know, puts us in a situation where you will have individuals, often unstable, but they'll be pushed over the edge and they will commit an act of violence. And there's no place in our country for that. How do you deal with what I must be, what I imagine must be a real challenge in, you're trying to sort of, this this political climate of violence, you're trying to sort of tamp it down by showing that you can work with Republicans, that you can tone down the rhetoric, that you can work with your colleagues, Republican colleagues in the Senate, which you you have done. At the same time, some of those Republican colleagues have espoused conspiracy theories and lies and slander and, and, and used rhetoric that has radicalized some of these people in the country who then go on to commit acts of political violence. How do you sort of deal with that tension? You you want to you want to tamp down the rhetoric and show that democracy can work and you can work with the other side, but at the same time, the other side, at least some people on the other side, are uh, espousing rhetoric that makes this worse. Well, let me let me start by saying it isn't always easy uh, to do that, um, but I try to make decisions in the United States Senate that'll benefit the state of Arizona and the country. And I think we get better solutions when both parties are involved. When we work across the aisle, Democrats and Republicans working together. I think the CHIPS Act, perfect, perfect example of this. This is legislation. It was my language. The CHIPS part of the CHIPS and Science, myself, Mark Warner, Todd Young, John Cornyn, came together, come up with that legislation, get it across the finish line. We get good ideas from the Republicans. We have some good ideas. You know, we come together. We, we throw out the ones we can't agree on. And I think we get a better product at the end of the day. So you, you got to put that as the priority. Um, at the same time, you can't, you know, you can't ever accept. Uh, and I think this is true more so in the in the U.S. House of Representatives than it, than it is in the Senate. Uh, but we should never accept, um, you know, when, you know, individuals are just going over a line and doing things that could cause somebody, you know, to get, you know, hurt. Um, that's, that's just unacceptable. So I will call them out. Yeah. Uh, all right. Before you go, I got to know what's the scariest place to be space combat or on the Senate floor while Ted Cruz is speaking. <laughs> uh, I would definitely, you know, say, you know, flying in combat, uh, my experience, I've had a missile blow up next to my airplane. Oh my God. On the first night of desert storm, an SA six close by and then immediately have another one coming right up at me. That is not a good feeling, especially the second missile. My gosh. You know, doing a last ditch maneuver or, you know, I, ha I had a couple missions where I had, a, you know, I sunk two Iraqi ships 
separate days, getting shot at, AAA, you know, fired directly, in one case from one of the ships, the other from the shore. And um, it is, let me say it's a little stressful. Um, but you you resort to your training, you know, you um, and you, 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 you accomplish the mission. That's that's what my whole life has been about, you know, working hard, uh, making good decisions and just accomplishing a mission. And now I have this mission here in Arizona uh, to do the best job I possibly can to the benefit of our state and our country. But I got an election coming up here. I ho hope you're going to ask me about this, John. We've got like five or six days to go. Yeah. And this race here is, it's going to be really tight. I mean, most of the polls have this in the margin of error. Um, this could really go either way. Um, I plan to be successful. Um, I also live by science, data, and facts. <laughs> and the voters in Arizona have a decision to make. I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, I've worked incredibly hard and we've gotten a lot done and we got bipartisan legislation done. And then when we couldn't get that done, you know, through the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, we're, we're capping the out-of-pocket expenses for seniors on their prescription drugs. We've got Medicare negotiation, big down payment on climate change. And, you know, so I think the choice is obvious because, you know, my opponent has just some like really, really bad ideas. But I want to make sure that folks realize that this 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 is going to be this is going to be close. There's going to be a lot of closes, close races across the country. You know, here in Arizona, I think it's going to be as close as any of them. Well, I hope all the listeners heard that and uh, go sign up for a phone bank or a text bank. I'm sure you could use the help in the final days to yep. uh, get out the vote, and make sure that people in Arizona mail back those ballots. Yeah, they could go, John, they could go to Mark kelly.com they can chip in a few bucks if they want they could also sign up to phone bank or if they're here in arizona or want to come here come knock on doors Perfect. knocking on doors really makes a difference it sure does it sure does uh senator kelly thank you so much for joining us good luck in these uh in these final days very welcome thank you for having me on take care pod save america is brought to you by beam organics did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain mood issues poor mental health and lower productivity i did yeah me too and that sleeping less than six to seven hours per night is linked to reduced white blood cell count. White blood cells protect our body against illness and disease, fighting viruses, bacteria, and more. Not many people realize this, but having a consistent nighttime routine is so important. Yeah, my consistent nighttime routine is that I get uh, frequently less than six hours of sleep. Yeah, it's not ideal. So that's, uh, that's, that's the consistency I'm, I'm dealing with right now. Introducing... Beam Dream. Beam Dream. Beam is the world's most innovative functional wellness brand with unique products for everything from sleep to recovery. And today our listeners get Beam's biggest discount available for their sleep product, Dream Powder, their best-selling healthy hot cocoa. It contains natural sleep-promoting premium ingredients, triple lab tested, no THC, and you wake up refreshed. 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream, and 99% of people experience better sleep quality. You just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir, and enjoy before bedtime. Love Beam Dream. We love Beam Dream. It's delicious. You get to drink some hot cocoa before bed, and hot then you're out like a bed. light. I like a, I like a light. You fall right to sleep. Find out. And why then you're asleep. Then you're asleep, which is great. Which is what the goal has been the whole time. That's the whole deal. Find out why Forbes and New York Times are all talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes, like Danica Patrick and Baker Mayfield. Don't love it? Get your money back guaranteed. For a limited time, get up to 35% off when you go to shopbeam.com slash cricket and use code cricket at checkout. That's Beam's biggest discount available at shopbeam.com slash cricket and use code cricket for up to 35% off. Pod Save America is brought to you by Sleep Me. Science tells us that the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering core body temperature. Temperature-controlled sleep repairs muscle after a hard day's work and improves cognitive function so you always start your day feeling sharp and alert. Sleep Me is the new home for chilly sleep. We're bringing you the same great sleep that Chili Sleep offered with nothing new except the name. So just a new name, new branding. Got it. Sleep Me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper restorative sleep. Sleep Me makes the Uller Cube and Doc Pro sleep systems water-based, temperature-controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep, cold sleep. I love it. These sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. They also, by the way, get ready, just launched the new Doc Pro sleep system. Two times more cold power than the other models. Whisper quiet. Mm. 
tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. You pair it with the new Sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. Boom. Boom. It's just a pool. You're just, it's just, you're just swimming in a pool. Sounds great. Oh, I might have to get one. Sleep me. Look, if you want to be really hot and sweaty while you're sleeping, don't get this product. Right. But if you want to just have a nice, cool, comfortable, relaxing slumber, I think Sleep Me is for you. How's it? How's uh? It's for me. I've been using it for I love quite a while. I love I'm, it. I'm very curious about how it's tubeless. <laughs> I'm going to watch this video after this ad's over. Because I have the Ula, which I love. But You looking for a tubeless version? Maybe. Head over to sleepme.com slash crooked to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro Cube or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for Pod Save America listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S-L-E-E-P dot me, M-E slash crooked to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up refreshed every day. This midterm season, America strives to form a more perfect union. But will America keep getting in the way? Watch The Daily Show with Trevor Noah on Comedy Central to find out. The Daily Show with Trevor Noah has got midterm election coverage you can count on. And that kind of reliability is more important than ever with so much at stake and so many monumental decisions to be decided. Like who will control the House? Who will control the Senate? What about Congress? Aren't the House and the Senate just a part of Congress? And who's this Brandon candidate people keep cheering on? Answering these questions is critical, which is why every single night, four nights a week, Trevor Noah and The Daily Show's team of correspondents are covering democracy like there's a democracy to cover. Because there is, assuming the thing they're covering is still a democracy. The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, new episodes weeknights at 11, 10 Central on Comedy Central. All right, before we go, we are handing it over to our chief take officer, Elijah Cohn, for a quick round of two takes and a fake. Elijah, take it away. Hey, John. Hey, Dan. How are we doing? We're great. Super, 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 super. super. <laughs> Never been better. Uh, John, I wanted to ask, you got that woman from Las Vegas, can't get her out of your head from that uh, focus group you did. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to Las Vegas. To? I'm going to Las Vegas. We are going to, uh, uh, John Lovett and Tommy Vitor and I are going to go do some, uh, some kickoff events. Uh, we're going to do some ballot drop events for uh, some of the Democrats running in Nevada for the House. And uh, I think we're going to do two events on Saturday and one event Sunday morning. I think Lovett's doing one early Saturday morning as well. Lovett's going Friday night. So. I will but, be here in Northern California doing things in this state, which will help determine control of the house, a state that does not have legalized gambling and very large, delicious buffets. <laughs> <laughs> Look, at that. Look at these guys living their values. <laughs> That's right. You can do both, Dan. You can do both. <laughs> yeah, BoatSafeAmerica.com. <laughs> All right, you guys ready to play the game? We sure are. All right, it's our take on the classic game, Two Truths and a Lie. Here's how it works. I'll read you both three takes. The producers have seen these takes. John and Dan have not. Two of the takes are real. One of them is fake. You must decide which one is fake. This game is three rounds across three different topics. John, as Dan said earlier, you are a current champion. You're on a hot streak. Any words before we get going? No, I'm just incredibly nervous. It's like uh, it's like it's like waiting for the new, last New York Times Siena poll, you know. Wow, a lot of stakes. <laughs> <laughs> Two takes and a fake. <laughs> uh, All right, just playing a you type. Meant, just playing a type. You, you meant the every word of that. <laughs> <laughs> this, this game matters. <laughs> um, All right. Let's get into it. Topic number one: the 2022 midterms are less than a week away, so you know what people are writing about. The 2024 election. Here are three takes about why Joe Biden should step down. Number one, it is frightening that Joe Biden does not know or remember what he recently did regarding an immensely important policy. He must be presumed susceptible to future episodes of similar bewilderment. He should leave the public stage on January 20th, 2025. Number two. Many 80-year-old-plus seniors are still intellectually vigorous. Famed lawyer Alan Dershowitz, for example, is 84 and still an intellectual powerhouse. But Joe Biden isn't your average senior. Number three. What is perhaps even more baffling is it appears that no one on Mr. Biden's staff seems to care for his legacy. If he stepped down now, he would forever be remembered as the man who defeated Donald Trump and passed significant pieces of legislation despite a thin margin in Congress. A gaffe ridden 2024 campaign would sully such a narrative. Which one is the fake? They're thinking. 
audio medium they they are both thinking very hard mm, man elijah really came to play today people walk me walk me through where where, I, my, I, where do i doubts? have to go first do i have to go first as as the reigning champion yes you have to go first you have I honors mean, oh I, okay i'll walk you through my thoughts i'll walk you through my thoughts it's tempting to do the dershowitz one because i could see you thinking it was really funny to compare him to Alan Dershowitz because Alan Dershowitz is a clown. But also, I could also see some right-wing troll saying that about Alan Dershowitz. <laughs> so it's either a real thing from a right-wing troll or a fake thing from a left-wing troll? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yes. this okay. is, which really explains the internet. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that's, the, that's the game. <laughs> um. I'm going to, and then the third one I feel like I've heard before. Um, I don't know. What do you, um, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with one. I'm going with two. One is the fake. So I got you both. No, no, no. I'm saying oh. one as the fake. I got you both. Three is the fake. Legacy talk uh. is fake. <laughs> You know what that is? He just fucking took a Marine Dowell column from a few months ago and just and changed just three reworded words. it. Yeah, I know, that's bullshit. I know, I know. That's what he did. I know. Fuck. That's so number fair. one, number one is real from George Will. That was getting a lot of play yesterday for being so ridiculous. The piece is way worse than even that paragraph because uh, it goes after Kamala too. Uh, and number two is from the Hill. It's Merrill Matthews, someone I've never heard of before. I mean that that like I need evidence that that person is real before I should I have gone defeated. with three. He definitely was. I ah, fuck. Okay. Anyhow, all right. Next. Yeah, that's a tell for Get me. Legacy time. talk is exciting for me as a sports fan. <laughs> what, does, what does Joe Biden retiring mean for LeBron's legacy? All right. Next up, we talked about this on Tuesday show. Dan, I'm excited to hear your thoughts on it. We have some takes on Elon Musk buying Twitter. Oh boy. Uh. Number one, these are all from conservatives, by the way, so there's a certain POV here. Number one, I'm thrilled that Elon finally got control. He immediately fired the left-wing executives, lots of liberal tears. Number two, the woke iron curtain has fallen, the mob is in full retreat, and we finally have free speech again. Number three, it's the biggest and most significant purchase of our generation, if not American history. I think it's the Louisiana purchase of our time. <laughs> <laughs> you could, yeah, three is three is absolutely real. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that two is two is fake. Dan, I'm gonna go with one. You think that three is is real because I laughed at it? Was that like a giveaway? That and just coming up with Louisiana Purchase would be, I mean, I, look, hats off to you if you did it. Hats off. No, I couldn't come up with that. John, there's a reason you're the champion. Great bounce back. Uh, number two is the <laughs> fake one. <laughs> number one is real. It's very generic. It's Blake Masters, though, which is why it's uh, notable. He's out there talking about liberal tears. Uh, so... I almost also, do that because just saying liberal tears is just sort of a funny. Yeah. Like, who just says that? But I guess Blake Masters does. Blake Masters. To me, it was really a coin. It was really a coin flip. And if we both pick the same ones, it seems boring. Yeah. Uh, and then three. You guys want to take any guesses? He's probably the stupidest p person in Republican media. If you want to take a guess at who did number three. Oh, uh, Greg Gutfeld. <laughs> no, less mainstream. Benny baseball, Johnson. Baseball crank. <laughs> nah, Charlie Kirk. Charlie Kirk. <laughs> okay, that's fair. That that's is, fair. That, you know what? Incorrect historical analogies is really Charlie Kirk's uh, bed, bread and butter. Or, uh, yeah. Bread and butter, not bed and breakfast. <laughs> yeah. The next line was: if he had uh, a bed, if he had a bed and breakfast, it would be named incorrect historical analogies. <laughs> His next line was: people may mock me for that, but I believe it. Well, if you were right. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> give it. You know give what? him what he we asked should, for. I, you know what? That should be. People should adopt that as their auto signature. <laughs> For eight dollars a month, Elon, can we put that on all of our tweets? <laughs> Dan, since we're on Twitter and you didn't have a chance on Tuesday, anything you'd like to get off your chest about Elon's purchase, the Louisiana purchase of our time? I think two things. One, I think is example of how insular the political media bubble is that we're so much more focused on Elon Musk's purchase of this tiny little platform with not that many people, where 90% of the content comes from 10% of people. 
and not worried enough about the fact that Mark Zuckerberg is just running, running roughshod over the entire world. That's one. Two, we should make every social media platform subscription based. Everyone should have to pay for it. How about that for a take? How about yep, that for because, a take? And let me, didn't let me see ex- that one coming, did you? Let me, ex- let me explain why. Because right now, if the reason these platforms do are so dangerous is we, you, me, everyone else who spends our fucking lives on them, are not the customers. We're the product. We are only exist to give them free content and then have our personal data monetized to advertisers. If we paid, they would have to pay attention to us. But instead, the customer is all the advertisers. So but the ship is probably set on that, but... And I'm probably not spending eight dollars for uh, to be able to sort my mentions among various people I've already muted. So who cares? <laughs> Look, I just love a take, and that was great. <laughs> so, all right, let's do the third one. Okay, let's do it. This is what we're going to call the conservative Q and A grab bag. A lot of conservatives have been doing Q and As on their shows recently. Let's take a look. Uh, number one. This was in response to the question, "What do you think of anime?" Uh, answer, I think anime is satanic. I have no argument for why it's satanic. It just seems that way. Number two, this is in response to a question about the LGBTQ community. Quote, I think male homosexuals are largely born that way. Female homosexuals are much more complex. (laughs) And number three, this is in a question about Daniel Radcliffe distancing himself from J.K. Rowling's transphobia. I read the books with my kids a long time ago. I remember spells and wands and creatures and adventure and fun. I don't remember anyone ever getting canceled at Hogwarts. Which one's fake? I'm going to say three. I'm going to say... I'm going to say three, too. That's wow. A fucking, that's a coward move. It is <laughs> a coward that's what move. I believe. Fucking playing four corners here. It's what I yes. believe. Typical Boston fan. Wow. Well, you are both correct. Uh, <laughs> so that makes John uh, our champion. Um, I, knew, again. I knew it was three, and I thought if I aggressively went with three, because instead of waiting for John, I, he would then default to two just to be different. No. But instead. But instead, he no, I don't it, care. He played I'm it safe to because I don't care. I'm not trying right to keep it, interest, if we, if I'm not trying both... keep it interesting for the listeners. I'm trying to fucking win. <laughs> <laughs> He's a gamer. Look, I think I have to say in the end here, John has an a, a extreme advantage because I he is no more online than I am because you have to be online to play this game. He just has fewer interests. So he's... <laughs> <laughs> Same that's, amount of time. Here's that's, just all political media takes. It's tough. That is tough. Yeah. I also, I'm not going to reveal it because I want to keep winning. There's, there, I, I, I feel like I'm in a mind meld with Elijah, where like I know he, he, some of the ones that you that you're making up, that there's similarities to them. That I, that I, there's little things that set set. Things oh, off he is, he has a tell. Uh, yeah, he has a tell. I'm going to turn my camera off for these. Elijah, while, <laughs> while, Elijah, while you're here, would you like to share with the audience? What you said to Tommy in a text about John <laughs> getting in a Twitter fight yesterday. <laughs> yes, I said that. I'm not going to say the person's name. I think we've subtweeted them enough this episode. But uh, <laughs> John getting in a Twitter fight with this person while he hosts offline is the equivalent of a fitness influencer housing a pint of ice cream on their Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. No no, no notes. As an extremely totally online person like John would say. Totally yes. fair. <laughs> I have no no notes. Look, it was um, like your cheat day. It was my yeah. cheat day. It was my cheat day. I've been pretty good. All right. Uh, that's enough of this pod. Thank you, Mark Kelly. Good luck. Good luck, Mark Kelly. I hope we helped. Uh, good luck in your race against Blake Masters. Thank you to Elijah for another two takes and a fake. I'm still champion. Bye, everyone. Apologies for our delirium. <laughs> VoteSaveAmerica.com. VoteSaveAmerica.com. Go help.